I'd like to um, invite uh, the, the executive director of Inter Paris, uh, Rita Morbia, to um, open our uh, evening tonight. Rita. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone in the room. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces and uh, to get to know a few new ones as well. Welcome also to those of you watching online in our first ever live AGM webcast. So an annual general meeting is a legal requirement for Into Paris, but also I welcome it as a precious moment, one where together we can take some time to return to the year past and ask what lessons have been learned, what have we accomplished, what is there still left to do, and how best do we do it? What needs to change? And this year's speakers for the evening, Nadia Fauché and Armin Yeltsinzen, will help inform our own analysis of what is happening in Canada and in Peru in particular, but around the world as well. So I hope that as you hear Nadia and Armin's stories tonight, you too will be inspired and motivated to think back, to think forward, to reflect in whatever you do in your own lives for peace, social justice, and equality. Globally, it's been an interesting and tumultuous year. Much of the last year was troubling, though punctuated by moments of hope. Many watched and are watching the revolution in Egypt and other parts of the Middle East with bated breath. The unfolding conflict in Libya with horror and dismay, and the earthquake and subsequent nuclear crisis in Japan with dread, just to name a few examples. Elections and, just, and, and thus the very nature of democracy around the world have been in the media spotlight in particular. Who could forget the electoral mayhem in Haiti, for example? And in the countries where Inter Paris has counterparts, their actions and analysis were also contextualized and defined by major political, economic, and social events. In Sudan, for example, where we work with women's rights organizations based in Khartoum, an historic referendum on separation was held earlier this year, as per the conditions of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement signed half a decade ago. South Sudan voted overwhelmingly to separate and is slated to officially become an independent nation later this year. In Burma, where we work with many in-country and exiled civil society groups, national elections characterized by massive fraud and intimidation, were also held, and many of our counterparts worked to reveal the true agenda of the military junta. And of course, here in Canada, we are in the midst of an election campaign, one that I think will be extremely important. And suffice to say, like many of you, I will be glued to my TV on Monday night. In terms of the life of Inter Paris as an institution, we have also gone, undergone a rather tumultuous year. When I spoke before many of you a year ago at the AGM, our funding from partnership branch of the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, had not yet been approved. And up to that point, we had enjoyed three consecutive five-year agreements. So that's 15 years of program-based support, with the last agreement ending in March 2010. Traditionally, this funding has been critical. It's been created and maintained by folks within CETA with a lot of forethought and knowledge of the realities on the ground. And I, I want to explain a little bit why this funding is so important to us. First of all, it's not project-based funding, one-off short-term projects. It is program-based funding, meaning it supports a substantive portion of Inter Paris's program in a more holistic way. It's a multi-year commitment by CETA over five years. In scale, it provides over a million dollars towards our programming. And in breadth, it funds work in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and activities here in Canada. And it is a cost-sharing model where you, our donors, contribute 25% of the funding towards the program, and CETA contributes 75%. So it really allows Inter Paris supporters to multiply their contributions. Though there was a seven month gap in this funding last year, I am pleased to announce that as of uh, October of uh, 2010, Inter Paris signed an agreement with CETA for another five years. 
Now, the lessons learned in trying to get our CETA funding renewed were, were many, but perhaps there are two lessons that stand out the most. First, we feel strongly that Canadians want their government to be using public funds to support social justice and human rights initiatives around the world. For the government to continue to fulfill this responsibility, however, it is clear that there needs to be, that, there ne that they need to hear more from the public, that this continues to be important for Canadians. So during our seven month delay, many of you last year contacted your MPs of all political stripes and made a case for support for Interparis. We strongly believe that your actions are in great part responsible for our renewed funding by CETA. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you. Secondly, we also believe that today in this country, financial independence is inextricably linked with political independence. Interparis' future lies in raising a greater proportion of funds independent of government. So here is my shameless pitch. If you are an ally and do not give to us financially, I would ask you to consider doing so. And if you already give, I would ask you to consider an increase, however small. It does make a world of difference to us and to the folks we work with in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. As you will see, from some of the highlights of our annual report. I urge you to take a look at the annual report. It's our 2010 annual report. Um, and I assure you that it is as beautifully written as it is laid out this year. I'm gonna open it to show you how beautifully laid out it is. Look at that. <laughs> In it, we provide a glimpse of how some of our counterparts are promoting equality, democracy, and justice in their communities and societies. This is at the crux of what is so inspiring about the work we do, supporting and accompanying and complementing the actions of citizens groups around the world, challenging the status quo, raising their voices, and defying power relations that lead to marginalization and exclusion. As an example, in all the places where Interparis works, people are reclaiming the right to have their interests represented in social and economic policies. For example, you'll hear about Peru and how our counterparts are promoting economic literacy in order to understand and influence how local governments establish budget priorities. In Bangladesh, poor women and men are organizing to demand access to basic government services for the least privileged. And in Africa, groups are working regionally to ensure that agreements with mining companies are transparent and that taxes and royalties benefit local communities. Here in Canada, our counterpart, the Canadian Health Coalition, is educating decision makers on how our healthcare system can remain cost effective and universal. And finally, as some of you know, on April 18th, just this past month, um, earlier this month, after two years of hard work, the People's Food Policy was launched. Inspired by the People's Food Commission of 30 years ago, this massive process of policy making from the ground up has involved over 3,500 Canadians from coast to coast to coast. And it outlines a vision for transforming our food system into one that is ecological, equitable, and just. The report, Resetting the Table, A People's Food Policy for Canada, is available online, um, www.peoplesfoodpolicy.ca, and we also have some copies at the, at the entrance. I could go on. There is much to be inspired by, but I will end my comments here. And I just want to thank you once again for, for coming out tonight, for listening, for being a part of Interparis, and uh, I hope you enjoy the evening. <laughs>